Yeah, that's Jeff yeah. McKenzie with BLM. Uh, Cecil Swaller is going to start off, so go ahead, Cecil. Yeah, I'm sorry uh, for cutting you off there, Jeff. Uh, my name is Cecil Slaughter. I'm with the Office of Surface Mining, uh, Reclamation and Enforcement. I'm located in Washington, D.C. at Main Interior Building, and that's where I'm sitting right now. Uh, looking forward to this, uh, giving this presentation uh, to the streamlining federal policing and permitting process. Uh, just before I start, BLM, just to let, I'm, I'm sure everybody on the line knows this, but BLM manages coal exploration and leasing, while OSMRE is involved in coal mining permitting process. Uh, slide two. The two main reasons why DOI undertook this review was uh, to shorten the length of time required for BLM to process a lease application and for OSM to process a mine permit. They also wanted to increase the program's efficiency consistent with fulfilling DOI's obligation under NEPA. DOI determined the best way to improve and streamline the process was to first identify the inefficiencies and then uh, present a plan of action. Uh, can we go to slide three? DOI initiated, initiated an internal review in early 2017 of the coal programs uh, managed and regulated by the bureaus for both federal coal and non-federal coal. Goals of the review were to streamline uh, leasing and permitting process to improve the efficiency of NEPA analysis and to acquire the resources needed to efficiently manage the federal um, coal, uh, coal program. If you could go ahead and move to the next slide, Rachel. Uh, let's see. Um, the report was completed in um, November of 2017. Recommendations from this report gener generated multiple initiatives. One of the initiatives referred to as the Regional Statewide Resource Study Initiative entailed developing statement of works for contractors to compile and assess regional state resource studies that would help BLM and OSM to streamline the federal coal leasing and permitting process. For this particular presentation, we're gonna be talking about the states of Colorado Utah, Montana, North Dakota, and Wyoming. BM, BLM decided to break the work up into multiple phases with Colorado and Utah grouped together and Montana, North Dakota, and Wyoming grouped together. BLM is the lead agency on management and administration of these contracts. However, BLM, OSMRE, and Fish and Wildlife Serve jointly review, not Fish and Wildlife, I'm sorry, Forest Service jointly review the end products and deliverables. Currently, BLM has awarded three contracts. Uh, phase one work for Colorado, Utah started in July of 2020. Phase two work for the Colorado, Utah uh, started October of 2020. And phase one work for Montana, North Dakota, Wyoming started October of 2020. Yeah, go ahead, next slide, please. Uh, the following are efforts being undertaken uh, with this work. First, we're going to, uh, they're going to develop baseline assessments of the active coal mines in the state, complete multi-part regional technical studies that can be used to facilitate analysis for EAs and EISs, provide review of NEPA air quality analysis and greenhouse gas analysis. Uh, next slide. Uh, they're going to develop study products that will be that will assist the hydrologic analysis for assessing potential impacts to groundwater. They're going to review and assess litigation brought against DOI related to air and water issues. And then they're going to complete uh, three reasonable foreseeable development projection scenarios. This should help also with EISs and EAs in the future. Um, and finally, they're going to develop baseline social economical conditions related to coal mining in the oil gas uh, development. Uh, the next slide is uh, Jeff's going to handle. Right. So one of the things we need to look at, we decided was to look at the process. So 
uh, are we are we uh, duplicating each other in the different agencies, or, or how can we make this more efficient? And then include such things as fair market value. Sometimes that takes quite a bit of time. Can we redesign, reduce, contract, redirect somehow? Uh, MOUs, FOIAs, fair market values, uh, NEPA process. And, and what staffing do we really need to do that? And are we best to uh, contract some things out or, or not? And then also, I uh, just want to mention the map we have is being updated. Um, the, our most recent one was 1990, so it's 30 years old. So only leases at that time. Obviously, that's way behind. So that's being reworked. That'll be available to everyone to to look at. And then finally, litigation. Uh, I'm trying to summarize and, and and put in one place what's what's all litigation been? Is there commonality amongst these different? Uh, Issues have been brought forward. Can, is there a way we can handle that better? Uh, how can we make sure we're staffed and ready and whatever to take care of the litigation? First, first step here in phase one is basically to understand what has happened and how, how many things we've had and, and have a, a common place to go to uh, refer to those things. So with that, uh, Cecil, I'll hand it back to you on number eight. Okay, hey, thanks, Jeff. Uh, I just got two more slides. I wanted to, you know, earlier we talked about air and water, and that's going to be, the, there's going to be an emphasis with this work on air and water uh, issues. Uh, you can see for air, uh, we're going to develop a, there's plans to develop a regional air quality analysis model. They're going to prepare and update air quality models um, in general, and then compile basin-wide air quality reports that could be incorporated by reference in EAs and EISs. Uh, slide nine. Next slide. Uh, hydrology, we're going to identify available information for assessment of potential impacts to groundwater. And they're looking at alluvial valley floors also to be included in part of, as part of that work. They're going to provide an annotated bibliography of references, uh, materials that will, um, that describes the geo, hydrogeology within these coal mining regions. And then finally, uh, the main one, they're going to provide a, um, annotated list of publicly available hydrologic uh, data sources and again so that a lot of the stuff can be um, incorporated by references in future EAs and EISs. Uh, that's it. That's it for me, Jeff. Go ahead. Thank you. Next slide. So we're going to also look at and we're in the process of looking at social economics uh, uh, addressing the public perceptions and impacts of coal mine closures. As you well know, uh, people on the line, I'm sure there's been a lot of public perceptions that their, their coal reserve resources are inadequate, they're going to run out, or that uh, there's, there's certain impacts about mining that, that they don't really understand and, and uh, certainly understand why they would feel that way because they don't have the information. So we're trying to summarize that. There's been a lot of talk about, uh, and, and Matt talked about uh, coal mine closures. What does that mean for a community? And, and how do you uh, how do you transition to a different economy, if you will, and how that will work together? Next slide. So we started to look at what is the actual performance uh, of these different uh, systems. On the, the the graph on the left there, that the black line across the top is the is the photo there of it is the old carbon coal plant uh, there at Castle Gate, which is now gone. But that was the production from that uh, plant during those years. It's been a few years ago now. And then the green line is the uh, gas plant in West Valley, Utah. There's five units there. Uh, the the uh, systems bring those up and down as they need to, and you can see that it's a good system and they and they uh, and they work well. The then the kind of orange line is the Milford well Milford wind wind farm. And, uh, and what that's done in, in those years. That's being updated. We're looking at uh, name plant capacity as well as actual capacity. And these are showing actual capacity. And then the one on the right <clears throat> there shows the IPA plant here in the photo. Those same uh, graph lines from the, first from the first chart are brought forward to the second chart. And you can see them down there at the bottom. And you can see the impact of the IPA and the kind of power it puts out. Uh, those, where it dips like that, each year they bring one of the units down and, and do a 
uh, the maintenance on it, and they had a little bit of problem in some of those years, but uh, that's pretty much how that runs. And this is all based on federal EIA data. Next slide. One of the things we, we asked about was, well, what, when you have these systems, how much room do they really take? And this is what we call a footprint. So uh, if you look at the one on top left, we have coal and gas make a very small footprint, obviously. Solar makes a larger one, and wind takes quite a large one uh, of land area and impacts uh, that, that makes. On the bottom right is this question we raised amongst ourselves as well. Here's coal, there's IPA there in the right <clears throat> little circle. Next to that is if you had a gas plant, could put out the same amount of power. It's, it's even, it's much smaller than even than coal. Solar then is, is bigger, but wind is much larger. And the solar, I need to mention that the solar and the wind, that's the nameplate capacity. And now we're looking at both nameplate and actual performance over time. That's just a couple of things. We do a lot of different things we're looking at in these in the streamlining, and we'd be happy to answer questions about that. But these are just a couple of things. Next slide. So the impacts of line closures. Uh, sometimes people, like uh, I live in uh, the Salt Lake area, and they think, well, you know, two or three hundred jobs is, is a is an important thing. But here in the Salt Lake area, there's so many jobs available, especially right now that they don't really understand that, so we try to relate that to what it means in a local community. I've, had, I've lived in the Green River, Wyoming, and Price, Utah, and I know what those mean. And uh, the employment and the pay levels that come with that employment at mines is very important. So that's being looked at in some detail. And then mitigating approaches. I personally have watched East Carbon and been kind of, a, kind of amazed what those folks have done with the old uh, Kaiser wash plant uh, reject that now is being used to generate has been used to generate electricity and and uh, they've got that uh, waste facility now they take care of this and a lot of things have happened there they've done uh, I've been kind of quite impressed by that and then as Matt mentioned there's federal and state efforts and resources and and how do we use uh, these good areas and these and these good people continue to have the employment they need. Next slide. So that's pretty much just a real quick look at things, and uh, please feel free to contact Cecil or myself. There's our email addresses and uh, and the questions as uh, as Rachel mentioned. Uh, we'll, we'll address those later. But uh, we appreciate your being online today and uh, this opportunity to meet with you. Okay, Rachel, we'll go back and we we'll go to, we can go to Pat next. And Pat will be at 9:15, so we can take a little break here if you'd like. You know, Jeff, since we do have a few minutes, I was wondering, we don't have any questions right now, but I was wondering if you could share, both you and Cecil could share with our audience how you got started in mining engineering. <laughs> Go ahead, Cecil. Okay, um, I can just give you a back. Uh, I think uh, I'm a hydrologist. I worked, uh, for 23 years uh, with the USGS out in Denver, uh, and uh, three, uh, three years in Utah, and then uh, the other uh, 20 years in Denver, a little over 20 years in Denver. I came to OSMRE uh, eight, years, eight years ago uh, at headquarters, uh, and I'm working here as a hydrologist. Um, I became involved with this particular project um, when, um, uh, I was helping uh, someone that started out the project, uh, Michelle Fishburn, and she left for the USGS and I took this project over. Uh, it's an, I think it's a pretty important project with this uh, streamlining effort. Um, it, it's gonna, I, I, I'm, I'm hoping, well, I'm not hoping, I'm sure that the work that's being conducted now will help us streamline the, the length, of, especially with the length of time it was taking multiple years and sometimes dec a decade or so to get these permits out uh, for both leasing and uh, for permitting. So I think this is a good thing. And um, that's, that's I'm looking forward to these projects continuing. I'm sure they're gonna build on with each other and uh, this will be a lot better, but that's all I have. 
Okay, thanks, Ethan. Uh, I might mention my my father was born in 1905. I was the baby of the family, and he's obviously obviously gone on now. But uh, he actually went to Alaska searching for gold at one point, and so he and I used to go out and uh, pan for gold in northern Nevada and southern Idaho. So that's how I got started in mining, I guess. But uh, I worked 30, some 30 years in private industry, and then came to BLM and. Uh, and I worked there for quite a while, and I retired last year. I've come back just for this streamlining project primarily, and uh, it, it is a very interesting one of Cecil mentions. Uh, part of what I've noticed is between even agencies to talk to each other and to work together has been very beneficial, and I think I think that will continue to be so, and to help the public understand the situation to make sure that they have electricity that they need, and, and not to tax them any more than we need to as far as what it's going to cost them for their power that they, they use daily. So it is, it's a privilege to, to work with it and uh, enjoy and have enjoyed working along with it. And uh, I think it's an open-minded and uh, a great opportunity and example of leadership from both BLM and OSMRE and the Forest Service. So with that, uh, Rachel, I guess we're done. We'll start again at 9.15 with Mr. Pat Akers oh. of Santa. And sorry, uh, sorry, Jeff, I was on mute, but I was just gonna say thanks so much to both you and Cecil. We did have a couple questions come in to the Q&A, so I'll go ahead and read those now. The first one is from Heidi. Heidi asks, the baseline studies mentioned in this presentation, along with the compilations, are these currently underway? And is, um, are they available for NEPA analysis in process or uh, is it due to be initiated? Jeff, would you want to, can you repeat the question again? Yes, and you can see it if you hit the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Okay. I'll read it again. So okay, I see you. The question is, the baseline studies mentioned in the presentations, along with the compilations, are these currently underway, available for NEPA analysis in process, or due to be initiated? Thank you. Okay, yeah. The, right now, for the most part, the two studies that, um, well, basically, um, all three of the, uh, the phase one studies are basically pulling these studies together they're in uh, most of this is just pulling information together so that they can a lot of the stuff would potentially be referenced uh, incorporated by reference in these future EIAs the phase one or phase two areas they'll actually start with some additional studies looking at um, some um, collecting new data where they uh, see that there are data gaps in our understanding of what's happening so um, Basically, when we're talking about baseline studies, they're talking about looking at what the current uh, area, what the current uh, groundwater and air issues are with these mines and where the mines are current, according to where, what they're mining, what the geology is like. But phase two work will actually, there'll be some work where they'll go out and actually collect data where they feel that there is some um, missing data. And that potentially uh, phase three too, uh, after we've looked at both these phases for both uh, for the states. That's right. I, I think that's a good point. I think uh, same thing for the social economics group. We're using existing data. Phase two, we start to get out and, and pull data, uh, new data together. And of course, all that will be available as, as the reports are completed. Uh, Cecil mentioned say, phase three. If we if it's determined to to continue into a phase three. And uh, I might mention that uh, we welcome any suggestions or thoughts if there is a phase three to just let us know and we'll certainly put in the consideration for those. But that's basically it. Phase one is to use existing data. Phase two, we start to get some outside data, new empirical data. And phase three could be more of that or other things. Okay. Great. And the next question is from Ryan. And uh, Ryan's question is, 
Is the goal of streamlining to develop a base set of regional NEPA documents that can be referenced for each mine specific study? Are there other goals to address or improve the leasing process? Hmm. And I can go I think, ahead and uh, it again if you'd like. I, I can just take uh, from the BLM side and to start with these so we like the fair market value has taken sometimes some longer than time than we think it needs to and we're trying we're working on that but look at that process look at the process of of uh, uh all all the things we're doing and, and are we duplicating each other or there's things that we can make it so it's, it, it doesn't take so long and, and that's what we're trying to do not to skip any steps to make sure they're they are done efficiently cecil any thoughts on that yeah, I'd like to say for the first part of the question, uh, the main uh, how's, uh, how I see this is uh, not necessarily developing a NEPA document where someone can pull it off the shelf, but it would be a situation where the resource available uh, would be available to someone who is working on a new EA or an EIS. They could go to the work that's being produced with the, these two, uh, these three contracts and determine uh, with areas that are similar to their area that they're looking at and quickly pull up these references uh, that they'll be building and uh, 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 that they'll be providing the study area and uh, reference some of those by, um, sorry about that, reference, uh, reference those documents, uh, but not necessarily build up a EIS document. They'd still have to do the work and potentially collect additional data, it, depending on how, uh, what the area looks like, uh, but it'll give people an idea of what's done in the past in areas where they're actively coal mined and successfully monitoring uh, groundwater and air in the area. I hope that made some sense. Great, thank that makes you. Sense. Thanks. And we have one more question came in. Thanks to Heidi and Ryan for their questions. This question is from Keith. And it's, uh, here's the question. Does the footprint graphic include the coal mine footprints to the supply power plants? Thank you. Okay, can you read that one more time? Does the footprint graphic include the coal mine footprints to the supply to supply the power plants? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, no, it does not. It includes just the IPA area, for instance. Uh, we found that, uh, of course, the actual portal areas are very small. If you were to include the entire mine areas, like East Mountain, uh, that would be much larger, of course. But those are out of sight, out of mind, typically. And there's only there's only one surface mine here in Utah, of course, and that's done at Alton. Uh, so no, it does not include those areas, but they're typically in the in the quite in the matter of a few acres, is the only surface disturbance from the coal that's going into uh, IPA typically. But some might be coming from Alton now, so there could be some. That's a good question. Good question. Great, thank you. Those are the remainder of our questions. What I would say is if there's any last thoughts, Cecil and Jeff, that you wanted to share, and then we could go into Pat's presentation. No, I'm fine. I think this covers it. And again, uh, feel free to contact anytime you'd like to in the future. And we'll be happy to answer questions and talk about the statement of work and what's included in this, these two phases. Yeah, no, that's, I agree. Uh, Thanks a lot. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about this project. I think it's going to be uh, a really good thing for both OSMRE and BLM. And again, this is just one initiative that they're working on. There's other initiatives to help improve the streamlining of the program. So I think good things will happen by it. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about it. Thank you so much, Jeff and Cecil.